Thank you so much for uh, being here with us, uh, Sadhguru. It's lovely to be here with you again. Yes. And uh, also, uh, Horacio uh, de la Iglesia, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we want to talk about, set the stage a little bit about what we're here to do today. Uh, the idea is that the lunar cycle, the moon, can influence people's behavior. Uh, this idea uh, dates back thousands of years, right? But it's been largely dismissed by modern science and medicine. Uh, yet the lunar cycle has, um, is clearly impacting cycles like human reproduction. Uh, I think it's very accepted that it influences the menstrual cycle and fertility in that way. But there are other behaviors, right? That, that have been also been found to vary depending on the lunar cycle, but that are slightly less believable. Admittance to hospitals and emergency, emergency rooms have been shown to vary. Uh, frequency of conditions like heart attacks and stroke, and even the uh, social interactions and our human behaviors of things like traffic accidents or crime, suicide, have all been reported to be correlated with the phase of the moon. Yet whether moonlight or the gravitational forces that accompany this massive space rock and whether it can influence human activity at all remains controversial. So uh, let me make some introductions and then we'll get right into the discussion. My name is David Vago. I am a research associate professor of psychology at Vanderbilt at the Vanderbilt Brain Institute, uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, I maintain a research appointment uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital where I collaborate with the Department of Psychiatry. And I have uh, more recently become the research lead for Round Glass, a global health and well-being company where I uh, am building research infrastructure and curating evidence-based content. So today we have this opportunity to discuss the wisdom of contemplative traditions that are thousands of years mature, uh, not old, mature, and modern science, which is providing new evidence describing the relationship between this big rock in the sky and our planet Earth. So we're going to have this dialogue how historical yoga sutras and philosophy describe the relationship between these two planetary orbs and how they influence each other, also from the perspective of modern science. And it turns out that there is evidence indeed that the moon can influence aspects of our mood, our decision-making, and our behaviors. And so over the next hour, I will uh, try to moderate a discussion uh, while I introduce some of the science from contemporary sources, from the research lab of uh, Dr. De La Iglesia and from the wisdom of uh, contemplative traditions like yoga uh, that uh, Sadhguru will share with us. So just to give you a, a sense uh, of, of who, who is speaking today, uh, Dr. Horacio de, de La Iglesia finished his undergraduate studies in biology at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. He got his PhD in neuroscience and behavior at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he studied neuro and the neuroanatomy of the master circadian clock of animals and the brain centers that control reproduction and the interactions between the anatomy and reproduction. He then continued his research as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and later joined the University of Washington in the Department of Biology in 2003. His laboratory, is interested in understanding how the neural systems encode time and generate rhythmic, physiological, and behavioral outputs to adapt to the temporal structure of our environment. I, uh, we are going to only have an hour together today because Horacio will be receiving a prestigious award from the oh, Argentine congratulations. <laughs> Ministry of Science and Technology are acknowledging him and his work, so we will... Um, I have to say goodbye a little early, but we're so excited to have you with us. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Adela Iglesias. Thank you, David and Saguru for having me. And while Dr. Adela Iglesias raises his volume, I'm just gonna introduce um, Sadhguru, uh, a, a man who really doesn't need much well, instruction, but he is a yogi, a mystic, a visionary, named one of India's 50 most influential people, Sadhguru's work has touched the lives of millions 
worldwide through his transformational program. Sadhguru has a unique ability to make the ancient yoga, yogic sciences relevant to contemporary minds. He's an internationally renowned speaker. He engages with scientists um, fairly often and has been an influential voice at major global forums, including the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, addressing issues as diverse as socioeconomic development, leadership, and spirituality. He's been invited to speak at leading educational institutions, including Oxford, London Business School, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, all the big institutions. So we're really uh, fortunate to have this group of people today, and we're, uh, I will do my best to moderate the discussion so thank you, Sadhguru, for, for being here and, and being with us today. Great. You know, thank I, you. On a day like this when you're having an award, uh, having this conversation, wonderful. And congratulations once oh, again. It's a pleasure, please. <laughs> I thought I'd start the conversation off with uh, a… from a paper that uh, Dr. De La Iglesia recently wrote um, uh, about synchronization of human sleep with the moon cycle uh, under different conditions. And he says, very… Uh, in, in the in the introduction, and I will uh, read that, and then I'd love to hear your comments. Moonlight is so bright to the human eye that it's entirely reasonable to imagine that in the absence of other sources of light, this source of nocturnal light could have had a role in modulating human nocturnal activity and sleep. However, whether the moon cycle can modulate human nocturnal activity and sleep really at all remains a matter of controversy. So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what is this controversy? Why is there, why is it not clear how the moon? Is yeah, so it, um, so it turns out that there have been some studies looking at um, sleep recordings from sleep laboratories in which uh, they had found an effect of the lunar cycle on the electroencephalographic recordings of sleep. However, you know, that was a retrospective analysis of sleep stages in people that happen to be in the sleep lab at different times of the lunar cycle. So it wasn't what we call a longitudinal study of the same individuals throughout the lunar cycle. And there was controversy because other studies emerged that said, well, this is not a real effect. Uh, and the jury was still out in terms of whether the moon could, you know, moon phases could really modulate sleep. And uh, I guess what our study added to that is that we did exactly that. We followed single individuals for at least one month and up to two months recording their sleep, uh, at least uh, their sleep timing. And that allowed us to really answer the question of, whether sleep was modulated by moon phases at the single person or individual level, okay? And in fact, we found that it did. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think the, con the controversy was around the fact that the studies had not been designed to detect this. Wow, that's fascinating. So how do you know it's not the, the, the light itself of the moon coming into the window? Okay, so... So we started, you know, when we started these studies, we I've been studying sleep in indigenous communities in Argentina for over almost nine years now. And I remember one day I was um, chatting with Miguelito, one of the leaders of the families. And he said, oh, you know, a couple of nights ago, it was very, it was a hot night and there was a very bright moon. And I went swimming in the river with my wife. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I asked him, well, what else goes on on moonlit nights? And, and he was full of stories, right? Moonlit nights or nights for fishing, for hunting, for social activity, for more sexual activity. Um, and I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Let's see whether we can capture this by measuring um, sleep. And that's how the, the story started, right? So. In these communities, we still have single communities that have no access to electricity whatsoever. So we started with the idea that if we did find an effect, it would be present only in the communities that did not have artificial light, right? Because we thought, well, there you can, you really can take advantage of the moonlight because you have no other sources, right? Uh, for, of, of nocturnal light. 
But we started looking at the data and we found the effect not only in the communities that had no electricity, but also in the communities that had 24 seven access to electricity. And even in some communities that live in a relatively urbanized area of Northern Argentina. So we thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting, right? That, that the effect persists even if people have the ability to control whenever the lights are on in the evening. And that was followed by yet another study that we did here in Seattle, where I live uh, currently, um, where we studied university students and we saw the same effect of the lunar cycle. And these are students that are very much unaware of what moon phase they're going through. So it's not like they're looking at the moon and say, oh, this is full moon or, or new moon. And therefore they are responding to to, to the lunar light, right, to the moonlight. In fact, light pollution in Seattle is way above the levels of full moonlight intensity. Um, so they could not be responding to, to moonlight itself. So that's why we're currently thinking and trying to start testing the hypothesis that maybe other physical changes associated with the lunar cycle may modify our sensitivity to light. And that light could be moonlight if you're living in a natural environment or artificial light if you live in an environment where you can switch it on and off. So that's wow. the general idea that we have now in mind. It's so fascinating that, that so you're, you're saying that the, the controversy has been whether or not the moon can influence sleep, right? And that's the controversy. Yes. And that your, your research has shown definitively that it, at least in, uh, Argentinians and in students at University of Washington, maybe. Uh, yes. That the, that the cycle um, may actually have an influence on how we're sensitive to light and that the, the light may be the mechanism by which it's influencing how uh, the efficiency in which we sleep. Um, but the gravitational force uh, may also have some sort of implication. I'm wondering if you yes. could... Tell us a little bit about how there's a mass, right, that the moon carries and a mass that the earth carries and that all objects are, have yeah. mass and carry some force. Is there something related to the, the force by the, just the mass of the two objects that is causing a, a, a change in human physiology? Well, you know, we, we're all familiar with tides, right? And, and actually, if you pay attention to, to tidal levels, it turns out that every 15 days, right, around the time of full moon and around the time of new moon, those tides get maximally high and maximally low. So the, it, it's what we call the spring tides. So they are the, and the reason for that is that on those, on those days, the moon, the sun, and the earth are aligned on the same axis. So the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon are added and you experience maximally high daily tides. Um, there's so far no evidence whatsoever that humans can detect those changes in, in gravity, right? I mean, we, we still don't have that. We love to have that, right? But on the other hand, there's no other, we, we don't have at hand any other way to explain why in a place like Seattle, right, where you have no ability to sense the moonlight, you can still respond to the cycle of the moon in that way. So our idea is that wow. on the nights previous to the full moon, because what's interesting is that what we found is that sleep starts later and is shorter on the few nights leading to the full moon, not, not around the full moon, but on the nights, you know, the, the shortest sleep duration takes place three to five days before the full moon. And it's what's interesting about those nights is that those are the nights in which moonlight is available at the end of the day. So it's available in the late evening and early night. And if you think about the utility of moonlight, right? In terms of our, you know, ancestors that were, you know, hunter gatherers. It's interesting to think that in fact, it's much more useful to extend the daytime activity with the moonlight, right? Than wake up in the middle of the night by the effect 
of the moonlight. In other words, if the moonlight comes out at 3 a.m., you're probably already fast asleep and you will not respond to that. It will not wake you up. However, if you're planning to go to bed around 8 p.m. in the evening and you suddenly see this bright source of light, you may actually stay up and continue whatever you're doing. And it's interesting because that's exactly what we do nowadays with our artificial light. Whenever you use artificial light to advance the activity of the morning, we typically use it to extend the evening activity. So we think that in a way, artificial light has tapped into this, this ancestral effect of the moon on our sleep. But going back to your question of gravity, so what? So the only explanation that we have so far is that probably that perception of gravity makes you more sensitive to that effect of evening light on, of keeping you awake. But the but the, the data is not clear, right? What how gravity can no no because we still you know as far as we know there's no uh, physiological data that shows that humans can respond to the subtle changes in gravity because you know they're not huge changes and of course. Animals that live in the intertidal zone, right, that are very well adapted to the tides, um, are very, their whole life is very much in synchrony with these tides, right? But um, so far, nobody has been able to show that humans could respond to, to wow. these gravity changes. So maybe Sadhguru, you could provide some light from, from the yogi perspective. Uh, clearly, there's a large, um, you know, history of descriptions of how the moon can influence our physiology, but there's no evidence from the modern science to show that gravity, at least gravity, specifically the forces that bring two masses together, can influence how our body and mind function. Um, so I'm really curious about what the Hindu uh, scriptures will say and how it can maybe motivate and inspire some more research. Namaskaram. <clears throat> See, when from the yogic perspective, if you look at it, one uh, important arm of yoga, which is called as Hatha Yoga, simply means Ha means uh, the sun, Tha means the moon. Hatha means to bring a balance between these two forces. So, essentially, approximately seven to eight planets and the moon and the sun together have a significant influence on the making of life on this planet. This is how it is seen. In this, the sun, moon and the planet has the maximum impact. Well, uh, as uh, well, the, uh, the male population may be confused about it, I think the female population in the world, human population, has always been uh, very much in sync with the cycles of the moon and that's the basis of our birth and our existence right now. But apart from that, we do not see moon as, uh, mm, what to say, just having some gravitational impact on us in its extra reflected light, like this. We see moon as the basic element which holds Earth in its trajectory of uh, rotation or uh, the revolution around the sun. In the yogic sciences, we see that, I think today modern sciences are confirming this, uh, that, you know, the moon as a, as a satellite is moving away about twenty millimeters every year. And when it moves beyond a certain point, it will start its impact on the life on this planet will recede out of that human reproductive cycles will go off the… See, it's normal cycle and that is how huma humanity will end. That is how human beings will slowly uh, go away. But above all, if the moon goes away, which inevitably it is supposed to do after many uh, million or billion years, whatever that is, uh, when it goes away, we see that the earth cannot hold its uh, track of a revolution around the sun, it will lose its balance and it will also break up into pieces. This is how the yogic uh, system looks at it. About its impact on our daily life, 
Well, uh, I, I, I'm sure you are aware of this, India uses uh, largely the Hindu calendar is either a lunar calendar in some parts of the country, wherever there is matriarchy, there there will be lunar calendar, wherever there is patriarchy, there there is what is called as lunisolar calendar, which is a combination of lunar cycles and solar cycles. Why this calendar is important is, see, today we are looking at calendar as just a number game of measuring how many days in a month, how many days in a year, or how many years in our life like this. Here we are not looking at calendar as just a numerical record of things, but we are looking at it as how we experience the calendar within ourselves, how the body responds to it at different times. Accordingly, various traditions, practices, rituals were uh, crafted so that in those times you can make the best use of what is around you in the form of Earth's energy, in the form of Earth's uh, trajectory, how it is moving, how its uh, northern face of the Earth, where it is pointed towards, its closeness to the sun, all these things are taken into effect as to what sort of practices you do. When I say Hatha Yoga, this sun and moon, well, this 4,356 days is considered as one solar cycle. This is segmented in different ways for different people. For householders, it's segmented one way, for the yogis, it's segmented di different ways, for the ascetics one way and people who are into regular worldly life another way because their bodies are tuned and they need to function differently. Accordingly, the calendar is used depending upon the moon phases and the… our… the planet's position in relation to the sun. Well, uh, as we know, the moon is uh, constantly showing only one face to us. Uh, it is… its rotation is synchronized with planet's rotation, so we're seeing only one face of the moon. This also is significant because the way the moon responds or the way the planet responds to the moon, there are uh, very wonderful stories how uh, they're always looking at each other. The moon never turns its back upon the planet. The day moon turns its back on us, we are finished. You know, in case the moon turns its back on us, that means uh, human reproductive system will go away and it's over. That means when the moon's rotation goes beyond a certain… Uh, uh, certain radii or certain circumference rather, then it will start showing the other face to you. When it shows the other face, that means the end of humanity has come. In a few years, it will go down. So, what impact it has on a daily basis? Well, it is not the moonlight alone. It is a whole… Uh, today, people are talking in scientific terms of electrical charges, electromagnetic impact and other things. Well, I don't want to talk about it that I'm not an expert in that, but in the yogic system, we have a lot of significance to full moon and uh, new moon days because those two days, there are different types of practices we do. Ascetics usually do practices during uh, new moon days. People in the family way of life, they will do all their practices during the full moon night because the impact is very different. There are variety of uh, devices that we created at one time where you know, like through the full moon night, how to expose your spine to the moon. Not allowing the moon to fall on the other parts of the body, a device so that a narrow crack which allows moonlight to fall only upon your spine and how it reorganizes your system. Three moon… full moon nights like that could completely reorganize your system from ill health to health, from uh, for in women it was seen as from barrenness to, to fertility and various other aspects and also in the mystical world various levels of perception were always uh, you know uh, connected with the moon as you might have seen images adi yogi the first yogi wears moon a crescent moon in his uh, in his you know upon his head like a jewel this is to indicate that he is at the highest level of perception because human perception and moon are very connected. Well, today in terms of medical terms, you… Uh, I mean the doctors, you must uh, translate this, but I'm saying in medical terms, we may see it as, as there is a certain level of neurological stimulus. When I say neurological stimulus, why I'm talking about this is, see, as in the evolutionary process of uh, life on this planet, 
of all the things, we are not the strongest uh, creature on this planet, but we have the most complex and sophisticated neurological system. That's what renders us as really on top of the pile of the evolutionary system. So this neurological development is the most significant aspect of who we are. And the neurological development of the human being and how stimulated it is and how active it, active it is and how balanced it is, is uh, in many ways directly related to the faces of the moon and there are very many ways in which people can make use of it to handle their various mental fluctuations and sloshings that they have. You know, many human beings go into tides themselves within their system because the whole oceans are going up, but seventy... seventy-two percent of our body is also water. So there is fluctuation in the system. It is just that generally I know there are some studies saying on this day, Mm, people tend to become more imbalanced or uh, th those who have anxiety and manic depressions go off control, this kind of things. I would like to say the moon is not causing madness. I'm saying this so that moon is liberated from this word. Lunar means if you say loony, people think you're mad, all right? So, moon does not cause madness. Moon just pushes up your energy in a certain way. If your quality is joy, you will become more joyful. If your quality is love, you will become more loving. If you are meditative, you will become more meditative. If you have mental illnesses, that also gets enhanced. Whatever is your quality gets enhanced because of full moon. It is not causing any one particular quality in us, it definitely does not bring about madness. It is just that it enhances who you are on that day. Whatever is your quality finds uh, a larger uh, manifestation. Because of that, uh, maybe in the medical institutions, mental and other kinds of institutions, people may find uh, some kind of uh, exaggeration on those days. Wow. Well, thank you for that. that, that, that so that there's clear description of yoga's influence, uh, uh, or, or at least the, the influence of the moon, the, the relationship between the moon and human physiology is clear in, hum in yoga philosophy. Right. And so and, and, and almost even more intimately connected into our everyday lives than we would ever think. Right. Most of our at least in North American culture, most people hardly recognize that there's a moon outside. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, that's because they went to the moon. You know, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe when we start you know, traveling to the moon as like, a, I don't know, as, uh, for, 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 for leisure, it'll be more in <laughs> mind is the importance of it but you you also mentioned um in your writings um that practices from the yogic um uh tradition that um specifically are meant for um maybe uh, spiritual practices S tying your behaviors on this planet um it, your spiritual practice how can a spiritual practice on this planet um, be influenced by a rock in the sky up there? Is that really a possibility? And if so, how, how is it interacting with um, your physiology, at least from the yogic uh, <laughs> perspective, right? So there's 11 day cycles where there's fasting. It's related to uh, that kind of practice of doing, working with, you know, your, your gut. So I'm really curious about how that, it relate to a spiritual uh, experience. Well, uh, David, uh, we are all, all this life, including you and me, are living on a rock here which we call as planet Earth, isn't it? <laughs> it's just a rock for somebody else <laughs> who is looking at us from elsewhere. So, uh, about how it influences, I, I do not know what is the direction of studies which are going on, uh, but I think from what I have heard from people, People are largely trying to measure changes in the brain activity and stuff like that. But uh, it would be helpful because from my experience, I know that the maximum amount of change happens in your belly in this region, which you call as the gut, because that is where the real change happens and it has consequences in the brain and the rest of the body. So, one important aspect uh, of uh, taking in the moon, there are practices in yoga, where you can live like every day, in your experience, it's like full moon. The same full moon impact is on in your body on a daily basis. There's a whole lot of practices like that. 
So we say this is a… somebody has become like an eternal moon within himself, that is like a full moon, always, because uh, certain things can be done in the system. The impact that the full moon has on various aspects of your body, the cellular behavior in the system, this can be replicated on a daily basis simply by activating this dimension. Well, uh, to give some background to that, see who we are as life is a consequence of how this planet functions. The how this planet functions is a consequence of its position in the solar system and definitely the sun is a major powerhouse f which fires everything and the moon which is a satellite by our understanding but it has a significant impact on the production of life on this planet. So what kind of life we are is essentially determined by these two aspects, sun and moon, playing their influence upon the planet at various levels. There are other planets which have influences on you, but their impact is much lower and they are significant only to certain people, not for everybody. But fundamentally, sun, moon and the planet are the three celestial objects. These celestial objects, moon, there is so much romance about moon, David just killed it, saying that it's just a rock in the sky <laughs> So many people have fallen in love on that day, David. Uh, now you just made a rock in the sky. <laughs> Why is this rock so, so special, you know, compared to, you know, other stars in the sky? I mean, it is close, so we see it, we engage with it a little bit more, but is there something unique about the moon itself um, or is it really just a, um, you know, just a, 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 an organic sort of artifact of, the, of this influence of two massive rocks influencing each other? Uh, it is not that uh, the rocks, it is not the influence of the rock upon us, it is not the content or the mineral content of the rock which is making the difference. Maybe that also could be making, but uh, essentially it is the geometric placement of the moon in relation to the planet that it's making the difference. Uh, for example, uh, you know the… Mm, there are numbers like this, I am not very good with mathematics, but let me tell you something. The distance between planet Earth and, pla and moon and the distance between planet Earth and Sun is hundred and eight times more and uh, the diameter is similarly hundred and eight times more. There is a geometric proportion to this. You can look it up, I am not very good with these numbers. But essentially there is a geometric relationship which is more important. That's why I was telling you, as the circumference increases, its influence will decrease. And uh, about three thousand seven hundred years ago, a certain yogi made a calculation that in twenty-eight thousand years' time, the influence of moon upon the planet will become so feeble and slowly the moon will start turning its back upon you. That is when human uh, race will go down. Well, uh, now about three thousand seven hundred years are gone, so we still have twenty-four thousand three hundred years <laughs> according to that calculation. So, uh, as uh, this twenty millimeter excess of the radius that is happening year on year, which has been confirmed by scientif scientific measurements, if this continues for another twenty-eight years or twenty-eight thousand years or so, then they say the influence of moon will become so minimal on the planet that it may not be able to help us to regenerate. So, this regeneration process is not in the brain, it is in this region which is very important. So the influence of the moon maximum is on your gut. So this is the reason on… Uh, in India there is a whole tradition on full moon day how you should eat, on a new moon day how you should eat, for every face of the moon how you should eat on that day. In terms… both in terms of quality of food and the quantity of food, what you should do so that you can get maximum benefit of the moon face of that time. So one important thing is, in India, this was the practice traditionally in the Hindu calendar that for all activity that we are doing, the… Uh, there were no weekly holidays, there was three days break for full moon and two days break for new moon, but there was no Sunday, Monday kind of holidays. 
So now we've just come to this because these numbers are easy to calculate. You don't have to <laughs> look up at the sky, as you said. Most people who live in cities don't even know there is a moon that exists, they only read about it somewhere. They've never looked up in the sky. At least every month they're not looking up, definitely not every day. Even the full moon nights, they're missing it completely because the lights are all bright and blazing. So where will they ever, uh, like uh, uh, Professor, or has suggested that, um, you know, the, the light pollution in uh, Seattle city is much more than the moon, so where will they notice it? They will not notice it unless they're out in the open somewhere. Generally, people notice it if they're in the wild or especially if they're on the ocean, then you cannot ignore the moon, you understand what kind of significance it has. Today, all our, uh, um, you know, marine uh, vessels are powered Otherwise, in ancient times, tides and mariners are like, uh, you know, <laughs> inseparable. There is no way. So their full moon, new moon and their expeditions were so very connected. It definitely has uh, more impact than just causing minor differences. We are… Uh, we were talking about uh, how the sleep quality changes. I would like to see that uh, scientists like you focus on how our life quality changes with the moon faces, how our wakefulness changes. Why are we talking about sleep? Because I see there is a kind of a fetish about sleep in this country. To sleep well, to sleep well. No, to live well is more important than to sleep well. Mm -hmm. If you live well, you will sleep well. That's a really good point. Uh, Harasu, yes. could you maybe comment on some of what uh, Sadhguru has been alluding to, at least from the… from not only from the yogic scriptures of… of a more intimate um, relationship that humans have with the moon on a daily basis, the different behaviors of fasting, of how they, you know, bring in food depending on the phases. Do you see the phases of the moon influencing any other aspect of human physiology in your research? So, um, well, other than, than nocturnal activity and, and sleep, um, there have been several reports, particularly in relation to uh, mental health, right? And, and, and this is really interesting because of, of what um, Saguru was saying that um, any character that you have will be enhanced at given phases of the moon cycle, right? And of course, if you think, for instance, uh, of a, about a psychotic patient, right? Um, if you think about our sleep-wake cycles, right, that are modulated by the moon cycle, then if you're going to stay up later on the nights that are leading to the full moon, then you'd have more of an opportunity to exhibit your psychotic symptoms, right? And this could be perceived by other people as an enhancement of the psychotic symptoms. But it turns out that there's some literature that really suggests that it might, there may be a real enhancement of those symptoms. And this is particularly in bipolar patients that, um, you know, I don't know to what extent the audience knows about this, but bipolar patients are characterized by the cycling between depressive and manic states, right? And it turns out that it's very well characterized that in a bipolar patient, if you shorten the sleep, whether spontaneously or you, you, you force this for environmental influences, they will get more manic. Whereas if you lengthen sleep, that's associated with more depressive symptoms. And it turns out that there's been several publications showing that bipolar patients had a very striking synchronization, some bipolar patients, right? Um, with the moon phases and in turn, that seems to be related with symptom, with, with symptoms of the disease. And this, this would make sense, right? If, if you're going to shorten your sleep around the nights before the new moon, that, sorry, before the full moon, that could lead to more manic expression of, of, of the disease. Whereas if you're going to lengthen it before the new moon, that could lead to, um, to more depressive symptoms of the of a disease. Um, you know, what I, I, I find really fascinating um, this idea that, that you know, any, any, um, any personal character that you have, you know, will be enhanced by the moon cycle. And I, I guess, you know, one, 
one question that I was thinking about is, is there any, is there something special about the nights leading to the full moon in terms of preparation for that night of the full moon in, in the, in the uh, yoga culture, right? Because that's when we find that main effect, right? That, that sleep is more severely affected on the nights previous to the full moon, not on the night of the full moon itself. So I wonder whether there are some practices that are associated with those nights specifically, right? Or, or with those days in general. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I answer your question, David, but-, but uh, Well, yeah, no, this I, is, it, it's, it, you're alluding to this, uh, the, the question really is still unknown. How, and and it's like, yeah. you also posed the question, how, how does the moon really, influence you know behavior we don't really understand that gra at least the gravitational mechanism the light sensitivity one's interesting in the sense that so you said that the light that's produced by the moon is not even as bright as the the pollution you get from the city yeah so why would you be more sensitive to that light even through another mechanism like the gravitational force yeah uh, yeah, and of course we don't we don't know what the mechanism is, but it, but it's it's a fascinating question, and it it goes back it goes back to um, what Sadhguru was saying that yes, we live in an environment where we're completely unaware of what the moon is doing in terms of the lunar month, right? But yet, you know, there may be inescapable influences of the moon on our physiology, right? That even if you live in a completely isolated built environment with thick curtains, you know, turning the artificial light whenever you want, you may still be under that influence. And, and that's suggested by our research in these highly urbanized environments like Seattle. It's, it's fascinating. So I, 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 was, I was involved in some research, actually at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, that looked at circadian rhythms and Charles Seisler, who is one of the world renowned experts in this area, he, he showed that you can, you can use um, a light cue as small as a spot of light, maybe the size of a nickel on the back yeah. of your knee to actually influence your circadian rhythm, to, to, to change the rhythm. So if light that small. Actually, yeah, you know, I think that the, the, the story on the, the light on the back of a knee was finally not, it, was, it wasn't from Chuck Sizer's lab, but, okay. um, but I think that didn't, eventually hold that story was from another lab but in any case but yeah but but i guess the point which is very important is that very dim light can influence your circadian system right? and much the, dimmer than we used to think about and a question would be do you think that the spectrum of light from the moon is something unique compared to say other you know artificial light so you know it, it likely is but we don't think that that's probably how, um, that was probably the, the most important, if you want, throughout evolution, the most important selective pressure for nocturnal activity. Um, again, going back to our ancestors, right? If you think about somebody living in Europe 30,000 years ago, where, you know, throughout the fall, the, the days are getting shorter and shorter and you need to gather food for the whole winter, well, you know, any extra little bit of light that you could get in the evening, you take advantage of it, right? Um, if you think from that perspective, that that must have been a tremendous influence. And, you know, we have the, the latest records indicates that we have 300,000 years of human evolution on Earth, right? That effect of the moon has been there for 300,000 years. And, and it's, to me, it's almost intuitive that there may have been selective pressures from the moon throughout evolution to actually influence our physiology. Right? Is, there, is there anything from the sciences to suggest that because of what Sadhguru was, was alluding to also was that the moon is shifting on its axis and so is, you know, so is our magnetic poles. And we know that that is also influencing um, rhythms uh, biologically and, um, you know, on earth seasonally. So I'm wondering it from your perspective, do you see any, any changes maybe over the last 30 years or so since you started doing this work uh, and how the moon's change in its spatial orientation is, is maybe influencing? 
No, not that I know. And, and, and I think 30 years would probably be very short. You know, if, if we think about the timeline that Sadhguru was talking about, we're talking about almost 30,000 years, right? So half a lifetime probably will not capture that, right? But, but uh, I, you know, at, at least as far as I know, I, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that specifically. But do you see an, um, a, a cautious kind of uh, interpretation of, of what's happening with, uh, you know, in astronomy, like how these, how the moon is actually shifting is going to affect um, maybe some of the work that you're doing in the circadian. Well, work. I guess, you know, eventually if, if the, the moon cycle changes in its period, right, we should expect that our response to it will also change accordingly, right? Um, you know, uh, even even if it is small changes, that would be a prediction that that could be tested. But again, I don't know how um, how big those differences will be. You know, in a in our testable life, right? I mean, at least in my life, I don't think I'll I'll see those changes. That that I understood. That that's probably well said. I, I would ask, though, given our limited amount of time together, that Sadhguru had alluded also to the, the, the relationship of uh, mysticism or spirituality and the moon with humans. And I know you've done some work with, with animals um, and melatonin. I'm wondering if you could, you know, in, in, in the best way possible to summarize that work. And I only bring it up because melatonin is this precursor to... Um, uh, it was a dimethyltryptamine, which is a psychedelic. Uh, it's produced in the, in the pineal gland, and it has all these implications for mysticism. So I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about some of the work you've seen in that. In that yeah, area. so, you know, we've done some studies in, in animals, and one study specifically where we studied the moon cycle in animals is with um, monkeys, monkeys that are actually nocturnal, which are very rare. They live throughout South America. This is the only genus of monkeys that are truly nocturnal. And amazingly, you know, these animals are heavily dependent on the lunar cycle, right? So it's kind of going back to what Sagur was saying that, you know, people that are connected with nature are very well aware, right, of what the moon does to them and how they depend on the moon, uh, even for agriculture. You know, I mean, people are timing when they plant and, they, and when they collect based on lunar cycles. Um, well, for animals, it's even more. And I don't think there's probably any, any single species that lives in the wild that is not somehow connected in its sleep and, and, and circadian rhythmicity with the lunar cycle, right? It would be very unlikely that that's the case. Um, I'm talking about animals, right? Um, I guess going to melatonin, melatonin of course is this, this amazing signal for the brain of where your biological night is. And one of the things that we're trying to determine now is where the, the lunar phase has the ability of changing that biological night signal, which is melatonin. Melatonin is the most important signal for the brain in terms of when is it that it's a biological night, right? Um, and we think that maybe one of the mechanisms by which the moon may change the timing of your sleep is by changing that, that nocturnal signal, right? That marks the beginning of, of the night. But there's still no evidence, neither from, from animal models nor from human models who are kind of moving towards that uh, in the next phases of these, these studies. But melatonin in general is a, um, you know, it's produced by the pineal gland. Could you be co comment on, it's controversial in the sense that it's been thought of as like a mystical um, chemical. Yeah, the, you know, I, I, I don't know how strong that, that evidence is. I, I, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's clearly, you know, um, a, a, an extremely important signal for the brain to know where your night, your internal night is. And of course, you know, part of the problem is that artificial light can acutely inhibit the release of melatonin. So we are 
every single day we're tampering with that natural nocturnal signal, signal by, by getting exposed to even very dim levels of light, you know, the light that you use to read a book next to your, you know, next to your bed is sufficient to inhibit melatonin. So we're always sending the brain the signal that the night has not started when in fact it has, right? Yeah, that's, that's very helpful just to give a sense of, of how you know, the bio, body has this internal endogenous clock, right? That, that helps keep our time um, within the same period of this periodicity of, of a day, right? Day is yes. 24 hours, but our natural rhythm is around 25 hours, right? Yes, and, yeah, exactly. And then there's this chemical in the brain that's released from you know, what Descartes referred to as the seat of the soul. And yes, and the Egyptians, uh, you know, referred to as the, the eye of Horus, the only unilateral structure in the brain is in the, the brain. brain. And it seems like a very interesting structure. And it's been implicated in, um, uh, well, mystical states only because it, it has, there is uh, some limited data like uh, Horacio was alluding to that it, it's data is not very convincing, but it is a, it is uh, the data that does exist. It shows that it's a precursor to a, a chemical that's naturally occurring in the brain and is a DMT. It's a it's a psychedelic that's used for very short, um, intense psychedelic experiences. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so that's why I was thinking, Sadhguru, you've been referring to the moon and and working with the moon, the 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 the, 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 the cycle of the moon specifically for spiritual purposes. You have shown Horacio that that birds have daily variations in melatonin that disappear on full moon days. Is that right? Is that no, no, that's not my work. Uh, okay, but I, I, I was actually not aware of that. Um, well, there there I, is some data that's showing that the the fluctuations oh, okay. in melatonin vary on the on the lunar cycle. Is that something that you have observed? In your work? Not, not yet, no. And we are actually gearing to do those experiments, those studies in, in human subjects, but yeah. we need to do that under laboratory conditions because of the fact that humans are very bad at exposing themselves to artificial light and erasing the natural signal of the night, which is melatonin. So in order to capture that, you need to put them in a lab where they remain very relaxed under very dim light, and then, then you can really see where is the natural melatonin signal sitting at in terms of noise. Wow. Well, David, uh, the thing is, uh, see, in the yogic system, there are simple processes with which, particularly on full moon nights, where you can get totally stoned out just on moonlight. Mm -hmm. There are processes to do that. And <laughs> as you can see, I don't know what the DMT is. You can see I'm on it all the time. <laughs> no substance from outside, it's from within. It is in some way, uh, on one level, in the physiological level, the significance of yoga is to stay in tune with the sun and moon cycles in relation to the planet. That is the only way this life can be in balance and with least amount of friction within itself because then the life's experience as, uh, I mean, whatever the chemicals you're discussing, serotonin, melatonin, all this stuff, essentially you're saying chemistry determines the nature of your experience of life itself. So, to maintain that chemistry which is always blissful and ecstatic, moon and being aligned with the moon is a very important part of it. So, uh, there are various practices associated with that. One thing I would like to request uh, Professor Horace is if they can invest a certain amount of attention towards what is happening in the gut with the full moon, new moon, I think it may be far more easily measurable than what is happening in the brain because what is uh -huh. happening in the brain, we see it only as a consequence. The real thing is happening in the gut. You may see certain effects in the brain, what is a consequence is one thing, but the process, the changes that are happening within the uh, gut region is very big and it is probably more easily measurable 
in, in my limited understanding of science, I am saying, because what is happening is there more solid kind of stuff, it is more uh, tangible that maybe it is more easily measurable than what's happening in the brain. That, yeah, that's a great idea. And there's a lot of uh, research emerging on the importance of the gut, not just in general, in general physiology and neuroscience, but particularly in circadian rhythms. So, uh, and it, it is, there are deep, definitely some physiological outputs that we could look at in our studies. So that's a great suggestion. Well, I, I think uh, there are implications for this work and this kind of dialogue and collaboration is really great. Um, uh, we are limited in our time together today. Uh, so in, in closing, um, are there any reflections that you want to um, uh, reflect upon at this, at this time? Uh, Horacio, maybe we could start with you and then we can end with Sadhguru. Well, I guess, you know, the main reflection is that we tend to think that we humans are very good at isolating ourselves from nature. And I think our research uh, clearly shows that there are some aspects of nature that, that are unavoidable, right? Like for instance, maybe we're all, all under the influence of the moon, even when we're not paying any attention to it. So that, that'll be my message too. Thank you for that. Yeah, that clearly there's, um things happening in our environment that we're not aware of, right? That we don't, that doesn't register in our sensory stores, but that have very strong influence on us. And they only manifest, or we only see it when, you know, for, you, for example, in a, in a female uh, reproductive system has a very clear rhythm to it. Uh, and when there's one rhythm in, a, in one, biolo one biological system and another rhythm in a, you know, very, strong physical system, they're going to influence each other. So that makes in total intuitive sense. Sadhguru, please, I would love to hear, I think, I think all of uh, the audience would love to hear your reflections on how you think we scientists continue to work with yogis and yogi philosophy um, to better understand the influence of moon on, on behavior and mood. <sighs> See, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, with all due respect, I'm saying this. See, there are many instruments which are being used uh, to analyze this data uh, that you gather. Mm, but, uh, well, it's... Uh, I, at least in my perception, it is well established the most sophisticated instrument on this planet is the human mechanism itself. <laughs> so, what is happening in the human mechanism to measure that? Do we have instruments which are sophisticated enough to what's happening there? So, why can't we do experiments where people who are in different... Uh, at least at a certain level of sadhana, their body itself is treated as an instrument of measurement, what is happening there? Not necessarily taking uh, their blood samples or neurological impulses and saying this and that. Yes, that is important at one level, but I'm saying beyond that, why don't we prepare people who the very body can be treated as an instrument, what it is saying, that is more important because ultimately that is human experience also. So if we want uh, this... the efforts of scientists to become a practical, implementable process, I think if we... I know this may be deflecting or deviating from how science has been till now, but I feel a time has come for that because in the modern sciences, they clearly, clearly recognize there cannot be another gadget on this planet which is more sensitive, more sophisticated than human body itself. So, how to use that if uh, scientists can arrive at that? I think what is going at a snail's pace could leaps... could go leaps and bounds and this generation could benefit, not uh, some other future generation. Okay. Yeah, that's a... Great idea. So, so and, I, and I apologize for having to leave early, but I really need to go to that. Um, um, thank you, Dr. For this, uh... Thank you very much, um, everybody. And um, it, it's been a great experience to, to hear you, Sadhguru, and, and all your wisdom and ideas. You know, I, I already have at least a couple of ideas that are, uh, that may actually change how we go over our studies. So thanks a lot. 
Namaskaram. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for participating today. And thank you all for listening and participating wherever you may be. May the moon have good influences on you all. <laughs> Thanks a lot, David. Thank you, David. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. And don't thank call it much. a rock. Huh? <laughs> don't call it a rock. Okay. <laughs> Namaskar. Namaskar. <laughs>